Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode. So with me today is Julia Lewis, and let me tell you about her. So Julia Lewis is an author of the book Soul Mastery Journey, as she is the oracle for souls. And you're definitely going to see what I mean. So Julia communicates with what she refers to as the benevolent beings, or BBs, as she calls them. They exist in a higher dimension and parallel universes. These BBs specialize in revealing the masteries that you are born with so that you can make more easily, I'm sorry, so that you can more easily achieve your soul's mission and life purpose. I'm getting so excited. I'm confusing my own words. And today, Julia is with us to talk about how to identify the obstacles that are blocking you from your full potential. Julia, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Great. Thank you, Angie, for having me. I was so excited about the call. I'm messing up my own words. <laughs> so, okay. I love to always start with a little background in letting people know how you became this, how you entered, how your connection to these BBs were, like what was your spiritual awakening, even if it started there or it started before? Well, I guess my spiritual awakening started way before. Uh, because I've been speaking to uh, spiritual guides for 35 years. So I, I, I've had that uh, experience. But in 2018, um, my ex um, died and I inherited a house that he started building in 2008. And the uh, interesting thing was the house wasn't finished. And as I'm sitting in this unfinished house trying to figure out, and I'm talking to my guides, like, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? All of a sudden, I started hearing other voices. And I'm like, who are you? And where are you coming from? And then they identified themselves as, bene as benevolent beings from other dimensions and other planes, other parallel universes. And I was like, wow, what is this about? And they explained that this house that I inherited is actually an energetic portal. And this energetic portal allows me like a cell phone tower to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And they started revealing things to me. And that's sort of my journey with the, with the BBs and to what brought me here today. <laughs> yeah, no. And I love it. And I mean, we never know where life is going to take us. Right. And I think the, and I'll be honest, the amazingness of the openness of being able to be like, oh, okay, you're benevolent beings from an other portal and dimension. Not the everyday person will kind of be okay with that. So the spiritual okayness, I think within us also allows that, and especially for you in that moment. But I wanna talk about something you just mentioned. So in our day-to-day, -day, we are very commonly talking about energetic portals and dimensions and, and all of these things. Explain to people what you meant by saying that that house is an energetic portal. The best analogy I can use is a cell phone tower. How how our cell phones work is that you have towers, you know, from one place to the next place to the next place. And so there's an energy um, ability of, of this house, of, of, of where it sits. And it's just one of those type towers. It's a, it's a, it's where a cosmic cell phone tower sits. And that's what I mean by portal is it just happens to be a broadcasting uh, space where I'm able to hit other cell phone towers that allows me to skip over to wherever the benevolent beings are. And they're from all over the place. Okay, that I find amazing just in itself because I absolutely, like I know what it is and I've done that, but not to the degree that you can say that and be like that. So it's like, okay, that's cool. So I'm going to go visit. Anyways. <laughs> That's how I understand it. Right. No, and it's awesome. So today you're with us to talk about identifying the obstacles that are blocking you from your potential. And I think all of us, whether we see it from spirituality or from personal development or from whatever way, we always have something that we feel we're not at our full potential. So we start calling it, it's a block. Talk to us a little bit more about what kind of obstacles these are, what what is our full potential that we can actually get to? And how can we break away from these obstacles? Well, the, what the benevolent beings, what the BBs explained to me is that we brought in masteries with us when we were born. 
Over our many incarnations, we achieve mastery, the ability to communicate, the ability to uh, touch people in a certain way, the ability, it's, it's, it's like our superpowers. And we bring those in with us because just like Shakespeare says, the, the world is a stage and we're all players. I believe that each incarnation, we have a mission. We have a purpose. There's a reason for being. Either we're here to gain mastery or we're here to use our mastery to make the world a better place. And uh, so what happens is we, before we're born, we are bulletproof. We have full access to our masteries. We know we're going to come in here and we're going to succeed. But as soon as we pull into this, this uh, suit, this body suit, and in this uh, limited reality, this three-dimensional reality, uh, we find limitations, limitations that are in our DNA, limitations, cultural limitations. We are told by society, you can't do this, you can't, you know, it's like all these uh, things that we start to, it's, it's almost like people sticking post-it notes on us of you can't, you can't, you can't. And so what we have to do is recognize that there's a post-it note stuck on us and pull that post-it note off. And it's it seems like when we start doing our personal journey, there is an endless, endless, endless. Every time you go down the rabbit hole, it's like, oh my God, there's more programming that I need to work with. There's more things that, that have me stuck. So the uh, what the BBs explained to me is that when the, you when I work with people to reveal what their soul masteries are they came in with, they also reveal what the obstacles are that are blocking them. And then they also work with me to use the tools to be able to remove the obstacles. So as we become aware, and that's why so many of us are so drawn to taking this training, that training, the other training, you know, energetic trainings for how can I reprogram myself? How can I move through my limiting beliefs? How can I, because it isn't just willpower of, of saying a mantra. It takes more than that. Mm -hmm for some of these deeper, bigger uh, obstacles that we are navigating in order to fulfill our soul's, or soul's mission or life purpose. And I'll let, I'll share it with the audience. You are helping me with some of these. And I can say from firsthand, you don't call yourself this, but I will call you this. It's sort of like you're a healer of healers. Because many of us healers know we came in with a purpose. We may not know what our masteries were. Where you told me the ones that you discovered that I came in with. And I was like, okay, like I have an inkling and I can see some of them. But many of them are some that I have been conditioned or shut down or, you know, the whole thing. So I don't see them. But something inside of me obviously knows. And something inside of me is the healer part of me that wants to expand. But then people like you, literally you come into my life and you're like, oh, energetically, this is the help the BBs and myself and whatever we can do. Because there's a point that even though, like you just said, we do all the trainings, we do all the things, we do all the certifications and we do all the practice, just like a coach, a coach needs a coach, a healer needs a healer. There are things that we sometimes are so underneath all those sticky notes, like you're saying, <laughs> we don't see it. I choked. <laughs> it's true. It, 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 it's true for me, you know, that, that what started this journey actually was, and I can't, I lose track. It was either 1999 or 2000. I was in a rafting accident and it was, I nearly drowned. And in the mo in that moment, time stood still. And I had already achieved my original mission and I was done. I was, I was ready to leave. And they offered me to re-up and take on this mission of bringing forward the soul mastery. I had no idea. So my life took a 90 degree turn in starting in 2000, where I started taking all kinds of certifications, all kinds of trainings, all kinds of just in-depth diving deep to remember, basically to remember all these masteries and to, to hone them so that I would be ready in 2023 to be able to like, oh yeah, I've, I've sharpened up all my knives. It's like, I'm ready to go in, right? Uh, but I had no idea that's what I was here to do. And they started revealing this to me in, in 2019. 
And it took a couple years for me to like wrap my head around it because the first time they said, oh, by the way, souls have mastery. I was like, what do you mean souls have mastery? I'd never heard that before. Right. Okay. So it's just, it's been a journey of, of figuring it out myself and understanding it and realizing like this totally makes sense. It totally makes sense that we would come prepared for our mission. Of course we would. And part of the reason that we recognize each other is because we have a common, I want to say theme song. Mm -hmm. It's like we all have a theme song and we're all part of that orchestra and we're all coming together. And right now, I believe there's this great awakening of people. I, th I think the pandemic was a wonderful thing because it pushed people into thinking about, hey, what am I here to do? And what am I meant to be? And I don't want to squash that down. I, 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 there's this incredible urge within to do what you, what you came to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then we go back to that. So we have that urge to do that, but we don't know what's stopping us besides working with you. What are some, I don't know, tips or things people can look out for to be like, okay, it's not just because, okay, the reason I'm saying is, is, which is when I choked, we all continue to do affirmations in our own personal work, in our own, but, but there's a point we're just banging ourselves against the wall because it's not moving. How do we know when we're banging against the wall and we need help from somebody like you versus how do we know it's literally an obstacle because it's not our path? How do we know if we're tied down to our mastery or it's just not our path? Does that make sense? Right. Well, I think for me, it, it's, it has always been about surrender. I have always surrendered. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a huge because when, you sur when, when I surrender, what I'm saying is like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm willing to take all everything I know and set it on the side and surrender that that something inside me knows or somebody who loves me enough, I want to cry, who loves me enough and cares enough is going to come and help me because I think surrender comes out of that deep, you know, that deep frustration of like WTF, like I can't figure this out, right? So I think surrendering is the key. Okay. It wants, because what happens is our mind, our mind is a machine and it's meant to serve us, but the mind thinks it knows the best. It, you know, it, 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 I got this figured out and the mind is, is, can be our worst enemy because the more we know, the more we train, the more the mind goes, yeah, I'm in charge. I, I'm, I'm the Wikipedia. I, you know, I know it all. And to be able to surrender to that that are to our spiritual nature to really and like say i'm willing i'm willing i surrender i surrender because in that surrender is when you'll hear the little voice and the little and it, and it will be a little voice most likely you know and then the voice then you nurture that voice and it gets louder and louder and with all the studying and all the programming and all the society and the conditioning we have definitely been taught to feed the mind and not nurture the soul. I oh, think yeah. maybe that's why it's also harder for us because we're so trained from when we're little to be smart, be intelligent, be logical. Things of the harder for romantics and poets. Mm -hmm. And it's, oh, it's very true. That voice. Yeah. And then there's, you know, for me, when I was going through chiropractic college, I found a church called the science of mind and in the science of mind, they use affirmative prayer. So really it's willpower. They're using their willpower to tap into the universe, the wisdom of the universe to affect a change. Right. And so um, it's, it's like, it's how do you, it's, it's almost like a, a, a mantra on steroids. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like, how can I more effectively use the power of my mind? Mm -hmm. Right. And the interesting thing is I, I, I checked in with a friend of mine who's a science of mind uh, minister. And he said that actually the teaching is dying. It's like the churches are dying 
they they aren't getting the the new people in it's like people are losing interest and i think what's happening in reality is you can't stay in that model of the mind you're going to have to go into the model of the spirit because that is where truly where this wave of spiritual awakening is going to come from right it's our spiritual awakening it's our spiritual nature that the mind we have to get our mind to surrender to that which again it's hard to do but not impossible no it, it's it's like it's the determination and yeah. really and truly you won't be there you won't surrender it until you're at the at the darkest the darkest night right <laughs> when you're so frustrated that things aren't working right and that's happened to me you know it's like that's happened to me more than once and i, mm -hmm. I reached that point and i like look even if i die even if my if it causes my body to die, please, right? Um, so yeah, it, it, I think it's so important to um, ask for for you for your spirit guides to 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 help you, and really surrendering and asking them for their help. I completely agree, and I'm laughing on two ends. One, I myself have said that the night of the soul the dark night of the soul for me has been way more than a hell than than just a night like it's like a decade like you go through that over and over and over and you don't see a way out looking at it spiritually every time I've gone through something I call it the onion layers I keep peeling the onion layers like in your case it's you know removing the notes the sticky notes but the other part that I'm laughing is, yes, we have to learn again to ask our spirit guides and ask our inner guide. And the reason I'm laughing is because not that long ago, hence maybe a week ago, I'm not recommending people to do this, but I'm very open and clear with everyone. And, and I share myself completely. I yelled and screamed and gave them all the bad words in English and Spanish that came up to my mind impossible because I was like, I'm trying my best. You need to step up and do your part. You need to step up and do your part. I can't do this alone. And, and it wasn't, that's why I'm laughing. It wasn't exactly a moment of surrender. It was a moment of venting and bitching, complaining, totally. But it gets to that point that it's like, oh, I actually wasn't asking for help. And I realized that afterwards, after I vented and I yelled and I screamed and I cried, then I realized Okay, I hadn't actually asked for help. Funny enough, I just thought about it. I was actually trying to use my willpower to manipulate the outcome of what I wanted. And that is definitely not trusting. And that is definitely not surrendering to the best of what is prepared for me. I'm actually fighting it. I, I, I'm i guilty of that too. I'm, you know... <laughs> I'm guilty. Um, I'm a, and and what I part of it sometimes is it's not time yet. It's not time to know something. I hate those. It, and, and you know, and that's like, oh, that's really frustrating. It's yeah. sort of like it, you know, because the interesting thing is the first thing they taught me was soul mastery. They explained that to me. They said, look, this is. In fact, I, I want to think say that soul mastery is like college, right? And then. Later, I mean, recently, like this year, they've revealed to me, it's like, oh, now we're going to give you elementary school through high school, right? Because if a, they want me to teach people how to connect with their intuition, how to uh, make it so they have better discernment, more accuracy, and they can, what has taken me 35 years to do, if, uh, if they could master it in three to five years. If they could do it in 10%, 10% of the time, right? And so now what they revealed to me is that intuition is the runway. It's it's leading up to okay. uh, your mastery. Because without intuition, you have to know, you have to be able to access your spiritual team. Because when you get hold of your masteries, that's when your spiritual team is really going to come in handy. Super handy in guiding you. Because uh, if you remember the, what is the uh, shoots and ladders, the game, mm -hmm. right? Where you play the game and you can take a ladder and it'll count, take you all the way to the top. 
or you could get the the shoot, you know, that mm-hmm. take you down. So really the this our spiritual team helps us to climb the ladders, you know, so we can get there faster, get there more efficiently, get there less beat up. Because every time you take down that down shoot, it's like, oh, now I have to climb back up again, right? Mm-hmm. So, and and they can also help nurture us and help us understand, you know, asking the whys. It's like, help me to understand why, 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 right? Um, I was in this relationship. It was a uh, 12-year-long, long-distance relationship. I lived in Northern California. He lived in Southern California. And... I stayed way too long. I probably stayed 10 years too long. But the last three, two to three years was just financially and emotionally devastating. And I kept asking my guides, it's like, you know, can I leave? And they said, nope, you got to stay. I'm like, oh. And I reached the point where I couldn't take anyone. And I'm begging. And I finally, I finally asked, why do I have to stay? Finally, I mean, after all these years, like, I asked, why? And after asking why for probably about three months, a little voice came to me and said, because you think it's your job to fix broken people. Mm-hmm. You talk about an epiphany. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God. Well, number one, nobody's broken. And number two, if they were, it's not my job. Mm-hmm. So I broke, I mean, literally that, that day I called him, broke off the relationship and I was free. The, the, the point being, I did the, the, the work to figure out when did I come up with this idea that it was my job to fix broken people. And what I found was while I was in chiropractic college, I was in chiropractic college, one of my mentors, instructors, somebody was preaching that that's what we do. We're fixing broken people. And so I adopted that. Mm-hmm. And then I shared this uh, epiphany with a fellow chiropractor and he goes, well, of course it's our job to fix broken people. I'm like, oh my God, they got you too. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. So sometimes we could ask why a whole lot sooner. I think that's a really good question. It's like, why is it groundhog day for me? Right. Why? And, and then surrender to be able to hear it. And I maybe it was because I just wasn't ready to hear it, that it took so long for me to get the answer. Right. Uh, but yeah. And it's funny you say that because so s- several things. I actually stopped saying why. And my reason was I would get so mental about it. Mm. I would try to find the solution for it. So I would ask why to see what the problem was to fix it through my mind. Mm. And it's funny because obviously we live in a world of duality. We live in a world of perceptions. We live in a world that you see things differently than I do. Even that comment from my chiropractor school, you took it in into your personal life at a different level. Mm. I find it amazing how our minds work. I mean, I'm both on the spiritual side of things, but I'm also in the scientific sides of things and when I learned the power that we have energetically what our heart gives out the energetic pulses that can affect somebody and this and that explains all these things but at the same time I found that fascinating how one word why can be seen in so many ways it's just a matter of how you do it so I wrote down because you know I'm always taking notes ask the why but then be willing to surrender to hear the answer So it's like, ask the why, but not get involved in the mental willpower of trying to fix it or blame somebody, because that's also what we're told. And many of us don't want to look that it's sometimes our doing. We want to find somebody to blame, but it's something we need to heal in ourselves or we need to shift in ourselves. Now, I want to ask you something about the spiritual team. Okay, how would you define our own spiritual team? Because those are, are they different? Let, let me back up. Are those different from the benevolent beings? Or are they also benevolent beings? I th- well, I think, I think they are benevolent in that they are loving, they are generous, they're kind. So in, in, in just, because then you have malevolent, who are evil and want to hurt you and, and and like that. So when I say benevolent, it's like they really have, to me, that means they have my best interest. 
Okay. Uh, I had to lump it together because there were so many of them. I didn't know what to call them because it was a group. Right. So I just started calling them, well, you're the benevolent beings. That's who you are. No, I love that you call them the BBs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's give you a nickname. <laughs> yeah, okay, it was, it, I had to shorten it. Yeah. So when I grew up, I'm not going to get into my story, but when I grew up, I was taught different versions of you have your own spiritual team. Really young, I was taught that my spiritual team was like one guardian angel and then a shaman, an Indian, uh, you know, whatever. As I got a little bit older, I started seeing okay, maybe they're fractals or their past lives that were an Indian or a shaman, or, but they are a spiritual team, like you say. And I would just refer to them all as like my angels, my teams, my guide. When we start, here comes the question. When we start connecting within ourselves and being able to listen to what we're being told, in your experience, how do we tell the difference between our own intuition's voice? Because our soul is always trying to talk to us when our mind shuts down, right? How do we tell the difference between our own intuition's voice? Or are we receiving the guidance from, let's call them, one of our angels, one of our spiritual guides? That's a good question. I think that there's a, um, I want to say a tone like there's a tone of I different benevolent beings have like a, you know, I want to say like a, a a soprano or an alto or baritone. I mean, you know, so there's like a, there's like a little or, or uh, maybe an accent, you know, there's, there's a little inflection that's a little different between them. Um, so recognizing that, you know, for me, it's like, I don't know how to identify the voice of my own soul. Okay. I really haven't explored that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the intuition, I know that that uh, there are windows, you know, there are windows of, of how information comes in. So there's, there's windows of intuition. And some of these windows are closed or they have, you know, it's a window or it's got a, a filter over it, like a screen. And the screen could be like a blackout curtain where it's completely blocked, or it could be a fine mesh something. But the point being, it filters what we hear. Mm -hmm. And what I have worked with is to open up those windows and to remove those filters so that I can, it's not just a faint whisper, but it's like, oh, I can hear a voice now. I can mm -hmm. hear it clearly. Uh, the other thing is when they communicate, uh, it can be pictures. It can just be like a signal. And it's like, oh, now I have to translate something that looks like a, an oscilloscope. You want me to translate what looks like an oscilloscope? Okay, well, what does that feel like? What is that? What is that? What are, you know, what kind of word goes with that? So sometimes it, it takes a long time to translate what they're showing me. So you but might I don't, I, so in, yeah, so I don't know how to differentiate my own soul, okay. but I think it's really important to differentiate your mind. Yeah. It's really important to go, oh, that's just my mind talking. Mm -hmm. And that's very true because we're so used to being in our own heads. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was going to say, you're probably really good at Pictionary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the other thing I wanted to ask, I know you're going to teach, you're working on a course and you te you're teaching people um, like the intuitiveness of how to actually meditate and do that my question to you is yeah. there are several different ways that everybody can connect or meditate for example um the way I explain meditation to people it's not always sitting with your eyes closed and in, you know this certain position and whatever it's doing something actively to disactivate your mental chatter when you're in that moment of peace and, oh my God, I wasn't thinking anything for five, 10, 15 seconds. That is a moment that I call you entered that state. I remember telling a client one time, who was like, I can't meditate and I'm ADHD and I'm this. And like, he gave all the reasons why. And I just let him keep talking and talking and talking mm -hmm. until he mentioned something about 
he rides a motorcycle. He goes, it's on those moments that I ride a motorcycle and I'm actively aware that I'm driving, but my mind is calm. And I looked at him and I said, and that was you meditating. You're being aware of your surroundings. You're not tuned out, but your mind slowed down. After that, he finally understood and it was much easier for him to meditate without having to get on the motorcycle. Mm. My question to you is, or, or my scenario to you is, in your program, in your course, do you people, do you teach people that don't meditate at all how to be connected? Or do you guide them in through their intuition in ways that maybe they haven't seen? Well, I think it's, it's twofold because everybody's a different learner. Mm-hmm. And so because we all learn differently, it's, it's a matter of like, you know, coming from the East, the West, the South, you know, the South, the North, and one of them is going to work, right? Just like you were saying that the guy recognized when he was on the motorcycle, oh, in that moment. And what he is uh, connecting to is now he has a point of reference. Mm-hmm. And that point of reference is something he goes to that point of reference, Right. So the, the 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 goal in the in the course is to give people that point of reference. It's a it's a it's a way of like, oh, I know where you want me to go and I will I will go to that place. And when they when you go to that place, however, a person gets there it is different. But how they get to that place when they're in that place, that's when it's easiest for them to connect with their intuition. That's when it's easiest for them to hear what what the answers to their questions Uh, so that's that's but i think what you pointed out is the key is people need to have a a homing beacon a point that of reference that they go to and i think in a way hold on i'm writing it down and i think in a way that's again i'm looking at it from the scientific point of view in a way that's muscle training if we want to call it something we just told our mind, this is the state we know we can get to because we just got to that. <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with my voice in my throat today. As he knows that he's on the bike and he gets to that, his mind, which is what you're saying, it can use that as a point of reference. That's how we can train our minds. Mm-hmm. And meditation is nothing but what it's actually called, practice. That's what we practice for until it comes to that. We just get to that theta state or that beta state or whatever brain active wave we want to get to. But that is how nowadays that we're so built up in society and stressed and all of these mental logical thinking, that is what we can tell our brain. Okay. This is where we want to go. This is how we do it. We know we can do it because we've been there before. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I mean, in a way, that's how we're conditioned. Mm-hmm. We actually are conditioned that way, you know, through being educated. We have points of reference, points of reference. It's like, oh, OK, I have to solve this problem. I go to this point of reference. Right. So we we recognize we recognize recognize places to go for our problem solving and and meditation or spirituality is is similar. You know, it's like when we know what door it's behind then we can go to that door and consistently go to that door, open that door, because now we know where to go. And society hasn't really taught us that. I mean, when you were a kid and they at least told you that you had a spiritual team, you at least knew that door existed. Yeah, I did. Right. Yeah. You knew that somebody told you the doors existed. It was encouraged in you to to use that door. Yes. And yet, because I I was just writing something that I want to talk about, which relates to that. I was encouraged to know that there's a spiritual world. I was encouraged to know that I wasn't out of my mind because I could see things. However, I was never taught to go inside. Mm -hmm. I was taught to seek them, my spiritual team, to resolve my life. And as I've grown up, and that's clicking with me right now, so thank you very much, because I it just clicked that that's another thing, and that's what I was writing down. Our society teaches us what you just said. We have a problem. This is the steps to go. This is what you go do. It's always outside of us. We always use our mind. Nobody ever taught us to use our heart 
to go inside our heart, which is where intuition resides, which is where spirituality is, which is the biggest en energetic magnet that there is. And that's the thing. It's part of me doing this show and part of me inviting people like yourself and other guests. I want people to know that everybody has a background. Everybody has a difference and we can all, we're all here to help. But the main thing is, how do you connect to the inside? How do you get to you, which is really you, which brings us back to this entire conversation? What is What obstacles are blocking you from your own mastery, from your own divinity, from your own potential? We just did a full circle. Well, you know, I, I think what happens is teaching people you know, it's like showing people, teaching people, you know, when, when someone tells you, oh, hey, listen, when you initiate the conversation from the inside place, instead of here, right, mm -hmm. uh, when you're initiating the conversation, it's a matter of, of, of um, your awareness, and like your awareness, there's a, there's a different awareness when you're initiating at the spiritual I want to say channel, you know, because mm -hmm. it's like radio stations, you know, TV stations, there's different channels. And, and for some of us, it's, it's like such a natural thing to use that channel that you're like, Oh, but the cool part is, is through um, resonance. When you're in a group of meditators, it's a lot easier to meditate. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're in a group of people who are having spiritual conversations, it's easier to have a spiritual conversation. Mm -hmm. And we are waking up that uh, ability in each other because there's that energetic field. And so my field is telling your field, hey, you can do this, you can do this. Mm -hmm. But in that language that our field speaks, right? that my mouth may not be able to uh, convince you of or show you. Right. Okay, again, two things. One going back to people who say they can't meditate and even myself that I can meditate. I've meditated a lot easier when I am with a group of people that we're all meditating because it's that field. Even in today's world that we're doing it through Zoom. For example, the online women's circles that I host, you can feel the energy of the women in the circle the same way I could feel them when I do them here locally at the places. It is incredible what our energy and our being and we can do and perceive without even physically being in the same location. That's fascinating. So I was going to say something else and I completely forgot, but I love the fact, <laughs> I'm all over the place today, but I love the fact that we got to there because again, we're talking about intuition. We're talking about opening up our windows, which is what you help people do. And I know we're running out of time. So where can people communicate with you and get in touch with you? Because all of this that we're talking about, even if they just want to start meditating or if they're already intuitive and want to actually like open up those windows, like you said, maybe there's like a little filter or maybe there's a whole blackout shade, which was what happened with me. I knew something down in my inkling, something was off, but I didn't think it was completely blocked off. And much less knowing the masteries that you come in with, that you can actually activate and do what you need to do. How can people reach out to you? Because I think it's fascinating, beautiful, and much needed work, what you guys are doing. You and the BBs. Yes. Well, I have a website and the URL is oracle and the number four souls.com. So oracle for souls.com. For my uh, intuition course, I... Um, and it probably will redirect to the same website. But for my intuition course, the BBs actually gave me a name for it. Oh. And the, the name is Exponential Intuition. So I would at some point that will be up on, on up in, in live. Uh, but exponential intuition, I want to uh, create that that uh, at least a website page so people can know a little bit more about it. Perfect. And I'm as always, everything's going to be down in the show notes. But thank you so much, because I think it's so radically important, the work that you're doing. And, and it's absolutely beautiful, but it really is much needed. Because like I said, I'll call you a healer of healers, because many of us came with a purpose to heal 
in whatever way we did and we got blocked and we can't see it. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate thing. But the cool part is, is we are a team and we're here to help each other mm -hmm. because we need a team. We need a team to shift. And there, there is a shift. It's like it's we're on the leading edge of that shift. Opportunities are opening up for us, for this planet to have the opportunity to make a, a, a big shift in consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, this big ascension movement that they're talking about is really us waking up and rising up in consciousness and awareness of we don't have to live in these lower planes of greed and fighting and war and all and and, and there's not enough scarcity you know we can move up into this place of unity oneness there's more than enough there is more than enough right and we are here to bring that message right and i think there's more than enough and even in things we don't know I don't think we really oh. even know the abundance and, and magnitude of everything, but it's definitely a step that we need to get there. So Julia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Angie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.